a good Nerev Shabbos. Every year when we come around to Lagba Omer, just a few days away from now, I'm drawn more and more to the problem of tolerance, which the most famous story of Lagba Omer seems to highlight. Lagba Omer is the 33rd day of the Omer. Lag is 33, Lamed Gimel. It's the yard site of Rashbi, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, and the day on which the dying stopped. What dying stopped? The dying, the plague that decimated the students of Rabbi Akiva, caused the deaths of tens of thousands of them. What was the nature of this plague? It's not clear exactly what sickness it was, but it does seem clear what caused it. Lo nahagu kavod ze baze. These Torah scholars, these students of Rabbi Akiva, did not conduct themselves with honor amongst themselves. That's how the Gemara in Yevamos, page 62a, explains it to us. Okay, it's quite a price to pay. But then again, our tradition teaches that interpersonal relations are somehow our downfall time and again. And we're very reluctant to learn the lesson. The second temple was destroyed, we're told, on account of baseless hatred. Sinas chinam. And now this, the deaths of thousands of Torah scholars because they did not conduct themselves honorably amongst themselves. The question is only strengthened, really, when we consider that Rabbi Akiva's main teaching, almost above all else, was the famous words based on last week's parsha, Ve'ahavta l'reacha kamocha. In Parsha's Kedoshim, last Shabbos, we read, you shall love your fellow as you love yourself. Rabbi Akiva underscored this, saying, this is the great rule of Torah. Ze klal gadol batorah, he's quoted as saying, tractate Shabbat, mentioned many other places. It's a tough nut to crack. Rabbi Akiva's main teaching was love your fellow as you love yourself. So this must have been something that he worked into his teaching again and again, over and over, in many different ways to try to get his point across. How could it be? How could it possibly be that Rabbi Akiva's students themselves did not get it? How could it be that they defied love your neighbor as yourself, even as their teacher tried his mightiest to try to imbue that message in, him, in them? And instead, they didn't treat each other respectfully. One reading is to say that they did follow love your fellow as yourself, but in a strange way. When you're learning Torah, just two study partners across the table, trying to work your way through a text together, help each other. Invariably, one person, each person brings a different perspective to the text. One tries to convince the other. The other tries to convince the one. Sometimes they agree. Sometimes they agree to disagree. Sometimes they help each other arrive at a new insight or perspective on the text that they're working on. Perhaps in the case of Rabbi Kiva's students, they could never agree to disagree. Each one determined that his point of view was the correct one, and he could not stand it. He couldn't live with the fact that the other person would have their own differing view and they would have their right to that. So each one persisted almost to the point of, point of forcing the other to accept his view, I love you so much, this attitude seemed to say that I can't tolerate you having a wrong view. If I were wrong, I'd want someone to tell me so. So I'm telling you, you're wrong. See it my way. That's really no way to have a respectful conversation, is it? Rabbi Eliezer Malamed, who is a popular author in Rosh Hashiva in Israel, writes in a footnote to one of his Halacha Svarim. He says one theory proposes that the plague that took the lives of so many Talmidim was in fact, the, at the times of the Bar Kokhba rebellion, if you remember from the martyrology that we, uh, that we uh, elaborate on Yom Kippur at Musaf, Rabbi Kiva himself was executed in these times by the Romans. Perhaps some of the students went out to fight the Romans while others stayed in the halls of study and continued their Torah learning, hoping to increase the merit of the Jewish people through that. As it transpired, both parties, to some greater or lesser extent, denigrated and devalued the efforts of the other, and as a result, both, meaning the entire Jewish people, were easily defeated in the uprising against foreign rule. It's not hard to draw the parallels to today's world. Those who fight and those who learn both actually increase the merit of the Jewish people and our worthiness, yet neither sees the other's value necessarily. In any event, let's imagine a bit further as to why people are not noheg kavod zebaze. Why are not people more tolerant and accepting 
of those whose views differ from their own, or even worse, they overdo it on the vahavta l'reach kamocha, like we're saying. They insist that the other accept their views without relenting, or making any space for dissent or disagreement. One reason might be because we do not stay curious. We're not good at that, like maybe we were earlier, earlier times. We don't stay open, open-minded to learning more, to understanding better, even to perish the thought, changing our minds once they've been made up. The more we study, the more we learn, the more points of view we hear about and learn about, the more it lends itself to imagining and understanding the other side of the argument, and that that side may have merit, maybe even a lot of merit. It's very easy to avoid this kind of openness and learning in uh, taking in the world around us, and we only read the media sources and only pay attention to the voices that confirm what we already know. Instead of remaining curious, open-minded, we seek out data that strengthens our views, supports what we already believe rather than challenges it. That's a function of so many cho- of so so many choices in information sources and the difficulty in finding intelligent yet balanced news and information outlets. Another reason that it's difficult to have these conversations is because sometimes we assume that we know someone else's motives and their intentions when that's not really warranted. We're experienced, we're knowledgeable, we've been around the block a few times. We know where most people are coming from. So why listen? Why actually listen when we know that somebody's really just a liberal at heart or somebody's just really a conservative at heart? So really, everything they say is just going to back up that point of view. We very easily prejudge because it's a big time saver. It saves us from having to listen to the other person. It gives us more time to think about what we're going to say to score our points in the conversation or the exchange. When we assume that someone else has a motive behind what they say, we don't really have to listen to their experience or their perspective because we know where it's all headed anyway. We know their intention is to support their view and to knock down or discount ours, so why even listen in the first place? That's another problem that gets in the way of having a real conversation where views are actually exchanged, not just lobbed at each other. Still another factor might be the question to ask ourselves, do people matter to us or only causes? It's easy to forget that every policy, every procedure, every decision on a small level or a large system-wide level has actual real-world consequences in people's lives. And often those are unintended or even the opposite of what people plan. In our zeal to promote an idea or serve a cause or stay true to a particular ideology, we become inflexible when it comes to finding solutions to real people's real lives and real challenges. We tell ourselves, well, they should just work harder to find a solution, then they'd be better off. Or we say that the policy or the rule or the law just can't accommodate everyone, and some people just have to tough it out, suck it up, or deal with it somehow or other. We can't fix everybody's problems. No policy is perfect. This lets us off the hook of trying to understand people's experiences And it sort of sacrifices individuals for a cause or a campaign. Usually that does not lead to very good outcomes and can often lead to worse results when the unintended unintended consequences make themselves felt. Last thing I'll mention for now, even though there are many other reasons that we don't engage in meaningful and helpful exchanges, perhaps one of the challenges that Rabbi Akiva's uh, students might have encountered is that we fail to take into account people's anxieties and fears. I don't have to tell you, this past two years of lockdown and isolation has given us way too much time to sit and be alone with our own thoughts, which sometimes turn to fear and anxiousness. A small dose of that maybe is okay. It keeps us on our toes, keeps us flexible and adaptable and ready to adjust our course when we need to. But the real fact is that as things that we thought were stable prove less than stable, institutions that we thought we could count on seem less reliable. And as a lot of anchors in our world feel like they're coming unmoored, that leads to anxiety and even fear. The worst leaders take advantage of that for their own benefit, like our sages teach us. Beware of the government, they say. They will only befriend you when it's in their benefit, and they will abandon a person in his hour of need. By contrast, the best leaders know that they can't always calm the fears or soothe the anxiety. But they do give us a sense that our problems can be addressed and everything has room for improvement if we keep at it. But when people are afraid and anxious, they act differently 
and often say things and do things that don't represent their best selves. Many people are their better selves when we listen rather than lecture, when we give rather than we take, when we share rather than we, when we keep to ourselves. The struggle that the greatest students of a legendary teacher like Rabbi Akiva struggled with, we also struggle with. How can we make more room for the other to be themselves? Not more like us, but more like their own selves. How can we share what we have so that everyone feels richer, more safe and secure, more fully human? The best way to build ourselves, it would seem, is to build up others around us. This 49-day period of counting the Omer is just about halfway through. As a people, we've once again do, done what we do best. We've taken a stretch of seven weeks in the calendar that's really a sad time, a time of mourning and loss for the deaths of so many young scholars. And we've harnessed its power to transform it into something good, something that brings about positive change. We've read into counting the Omer 49 days. We've brought out 49 different ways to improve ourselves and our relationships with others and even our relationship with God and focused our attention each day on a different way to work on that, a different angle, a different facet of ourselves that we can explore and dust off, maybe polish up a little bit. For those unaware of this, we have a short video every day on our website discussing one aspect of Sfira Ta Omer, in brief, all based on a book by Mrs. Hani Juravel, which you can probably still find at the Jewish bookstores in town. Each day, we highlight the counting of the day, the Sfira, and we give an example of a growth opportunity, a small, well-defined, uh, uh, within our grasp, accomplishable inflection point for making good things happen. You can catch up on all the ones since Pesach, if you like. It's uh, still on the website. And if it interests you, you can keep tuning in every day until Shavuot as we add new ones. We're also mentioning these briefly after Minyan every, each morning. So that's an added bonus of coming to Shul. Hopefully, hopefully by the time we complete the counting of the seven weeks, we'll all be in a better place of confidence, generosity, good health, happiness, and most of all, peace. Peace in the world, peace among ourselves, and peace within ourselves. Shabbat Shalom.